The Committee on Space will come to order. And without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. Good morning. Welcome to, today, uh, to today's hearing titled the International Space Station, Addressing Operational Challenges. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witnesses. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to our hearing today, and I want to thank our witnesses for taking time uh, to appear before our committee. Since 2013, the ISS program has experienced a number of challenges. As a can-do nation, America has always been committed to identifying challenges, addressing them, and advancing to reach out and reach our goal and destiny. We have that same commit uh, commitment with the ISS. During this time, astronauts have experienced water leaks in their suits three times, with one incident occurring during a spacewalk. On April the 26, 2013, an unmanned Russian Progress cargo vehicle damaged the laser uh, radar deflector reflector when docking with the ISS. On January the 14th, 2015, a false alarm of an ammonia leak caused the crew to retreat into the Russian segment. On October 28, 2014, an Orbital Sciences unmanned cargo launch failed just after launch. On April the 28th, 2015, a separate Russian Progress cargo, uh, cargo vehicle failed to reach the ISS. On June the 7th, 2015, a planned reboost of the ISS using a docked Progress vehicle failed, but eventually was successful after troubleshooting. On June the 10th, 2015, a visiting Soyuz vehicle unexpectedly fired its engines without being commanded. Most recently, on June the 28th, 2015, a SpaceX unmanned, space, SpaceX unmanned cargo uh, launch failed as well. All of these incidents highlight the challenges of operating in space, and they remind us that NASA's contractors, engineers, and astronauts must be ever vigilant. These events have challenged ISS operations, but the fact that the program was able to effectively respond to these setbacks is a testament to NASA, the ISS partners, and the contractors. We do not know the root causes of some of the accidents yet, but once we have more information, we will be better suited to review those individual events. In the meantime, this hearing allows us to evaluate the operational status of the ISS, review efforts to utilize the unique asset, and assess the prospects for future operations. The ISS is one of the most complex and expensive man-made objects ever built. The American taxpayers currently invest approximately $3 billion per year in this laboratory. We must ensure that every dollar is spent effectively and efficiently. The ISS offers a unique microgravity environment for scientists and engineers to utilize. NASA recently released its Benefits to Humanity publication this week detailing the many benefits that ISS provides back to our lives here on Earth. From advances in our understanding of human health and performance to our use of new materials to the utilization of robotics and satellites, the benefits we receive from ISS are many and diverse and remarkable. In addition to the benefits here on Earth, the ISS offers the conditions necessary to prepare and develop critical technologies for deep space and long-duration human spaceflight missions. Successive NASA authorizations direct the administration to utilize the ISS for this purpose. The Human Research Program and Advanced Exploration Systems Program at NASA are on the cutting edge of developing the systems we need to send humans ever deeper into the solar system than before. Right now, Captain Scott Kelly is on day 104 of his year-long mission to study the effects of long-duration human spaceflight. In addition to the utilization efforts of NASA's research programs, the NASA Authorization Act of 2005 designated part of the ISS as a national lab 
of the NASA Authorization Act of 2010 directed the administration to sign a cooperative agreement with a nonprofit to manage it. NASA selected the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, or CASES, to lead this effort. The Government Accountability Office noted in a recent report that CASES had made great strides in fulfilling the mandate under the law, but that more work needed to be done to ensure that measurable progress was being made in a quantifiable manner. I hope to hear from NASA today that the agency is making progress towards answering uh, this recommendation from GAO. As we keep an eye on the present operation and utilization of the ISS, we must also look to the future. Last year, the administration announced support for the extension of the ISS program from 2020 to 2024. At present, federal law limits the life of the ISS to 2020. Absent action from Congress to extend it, the administration would be required to begin closeout of the program. There are many questions about the request for this extension. The bipartisan House-passed NASA Authorization Act of 2015 requires the administration to provide a report to Congress on efforts by the administration to utilize the ISS and how to quantify benefits back to the nation for the required investment for this extension. It also requires the administration to develop a government-wide utilization plan for the ISS to ensure that every minute the facility is in orbit, we are doing what we can to get the most out of it. These reports are critical for Congress to understand the issues that inform whether to extend the ISS. This committee has a responsibility to ensure that the American taxpayers are getting all they can from every dollar that they send to the federal government. I believe this investment is worthwhile and that the benefits far outweigh the costs. Support for the ISS and its operations and utilization is not a partisan issue. It is an American issue, and I look forward to working with my friends on the other side of the aisle and our partners in the space industry to understand how we can all meet the operational challenges facing the ISS program. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentlelady from Maryland, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning and welcome to our distinguished panel of witnesses. Uh, I appreciate holding this hearing now, the International Space Station addressing operational challenges. And as I listen to the, um, to the chairman, I'm reminded that um, you know, the challenges that NASA faces and the agency faces in operating uh, the International Space Station, I would be more concerned if we weren't able to overcome some of those challenges. And I think it's a credit to the, uh, the crew and the partners that that is true. Uh, about a year ago, um, I and the members of our committee sat in this room, looked on the screen there, and had the opportunity to communicate with our NASA crew that was aboard the International Space Station, including um, NASA astronaut Rick Wiseman, who's from Maryland. I would note that I promised him crab cakes, and unfortunately, one of those uh, accidents that the chairman referred to uh, destroyed my crab cake delivery, but uh, Rick Wiseman visited with me in my office just a couple of weeks ago, and we made okay on that. Uh, what happens when you connect real time with our net astronauts who are living and working and carrying out research in this amazing laboratory that's orbiting 250 miles above us uh, every 90 minutes is really quite an inspiration. Uh, thanks to NASA, the crews aboard the ISS, and so many school children uh, have also had the opportunity to ask questions and learn about human space flight uh, through similar downlink events that we experience here in this room. Uh, yet in the thrill of seeing and hearing those who inhabit our on-orbit laboratory, we can sometimes forget just how difficult, demanding, and risky it is to maintain and operate the International Space Station um, because sometimes we think it's just ordinary and it turns out that it's rather extraordinary. Orbital debris malfunctions to key systems, both internal and external to the ISS, and human health hazards pose significant risk to the ISS facility and its crew. 
the unfortunate loss of the SpaceX 7 cargo resupply mission less than two weeks ago, along with the earlier losses of the Russian Progress and Orbital ATK cargo missions over the past eight months, are again stark reminders of the risks and challenges that NASA and its partners have to face. Uh, the successful management of these risks for, for more than 15 years is a testament to NASA and its industry and to uh, international partners. I'm confident that SpaceX, Orbital ATK, in collaboration with the FAA and NASA, will identify and resolve the problems that led to the launch failures. They'll resume cargo resupply to the ISS as soon as it's safe to do so. And in fact, um, the ISS actually has been resupplied uh, through its partners. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we don't have any time to spare. The ISS is a temporary facility. It's currently authorized for operations, as you've described, through 2020. And given that the operations cost about $3 billion in taxpayer dollars every year, a cost that's actually projected to increase, um, coupled with the challenges involved in sustaining operations, we really need to ensure that our vision for the ISS is clear and our goals and objectives for using this unique facility are aligned with that vision. I'm pleased that the number of ISS users has actually grown. We've had uh, concerns about that raised here in this committee. In addition to NASA researchers and NASA-supported academic researchers, the ISS National Laboratory Management entity, CASIS, has drawn new commercial users, including pharmaceutical companies, to the ISS. However, while the range of ISS uses is expanding, the resources to support those activities are not. Funding for the ISS research represents a mere 12 percent of the overall ISS budget. In addition, constraints on cargo transportation uh, to the International Space Station, as well as available power and precious crew time, limit what research can be accomplished at the station. And in that regard, I know that many of us want to understand the implications of cargo resupply interruptions on planned ISS research, crew operations, and the sustainability of the station. In addition, Mr. Chairman, there's, a, there's critical work to be done on the ISS in areas of human health research and technology development that needs to be carried out if we're going to make progress toward the long-term goal of sending humans to Mars. In January 2014, the Obama administration proposed to extend ISS operations until at least the year 2024. The administration has three rationales for the extension to complete ISS research that supports long-duration human missions beyond low Earth orbit, to garner societal benefits from ISS research, some of which we see uh, here, and to give NASA and private partners more time to transition to commercial cargo crew, cargo and crew, allowing NASA to focus on human exploration of deep space. Today's hearing provides us the opportunity to examine those rationales in the context of the cost and risk that NASA and its international partners will face in sustaining the ISS for that length of time. So, Mr. Chairman, we have a lot to discuss this morning, and I want to thank our witnesses again for being here. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee for a statement, the gentlelady from Texas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on the International Space Station. This really is an important topic, and I look forward to the testimony of our panel of witnesses, and I welcome them. It is no secret that I have been a long supporter of the ISS. It plays a unique role in furthering research, advancing human space flight, and inspiring our young people. Moreover, in addition to being an incredible engineering achievement, it provides a very visible demonstration of the benefits that can be derived from peaceful international cooperation in space. Failures of commercial cargo transportation missions to the ISS remind us that space flight is not easy. Failures will occur, and unfortunately, these failures will have impacts on the program. We need to better understand those impacts, as well as the plans for dealing with them going forward. And we need to know whether there are any lessons learned that need to be applied to the far more challenging commercial crew transportation program. I've said before that the ISS is a perishable commodity. We need to be clear on what NASA needs to accomplish with this unique laboratory while it is still operational. 
While the administration has proposed to extend the ISS operations until 2024, maintaining the ISS involves risk and a significant opportunity cost. We need to ensure that the ISS is being used in a way that maximizes its productivity and value to the nation. In addition, if we are to ensure that the needed ISS research and technology activities are carried out, it is clear that we are going to need to make the necessary investments. Stagnant ISS research budgets do not communicate the message that we are serious about supporting the important research and technology efforts that can only be accomplished on the ISS. That is a problem that Congress could and should fix. Well, Mr. Chairman, we have a lot of issues to discuss today, and I welcome our witnesses and look forward to a productive hearing. I thank you and yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I would like to introduce our witnesses. Bill Gerstenmeyer is the Associate Administrator of Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA. Our second witness today is John Elbon, Vice President and General Manager of Space Exploration for the Boeing Company. Testifying third is the Honorable Paul Martin, who has served as NASA's Inspector General since 2009. Our third witness is Shelby Oakley, Acting Director of Acquisition and Sourcing Management for the uh, Government Account uh, Accountability Office, GAO. Today's final witness is Dr. James Powelzik, an Associate Professor of Physiology and Kinesiology at the Pennsylvania State University and a retired astronaut. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement will be made part of the record. I now recognize Mr. Gerstenmeyer for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of myself and the men and women that work on the International Space Station. This is one of the most talented and dedicated international teams in the world. The ISS is an amazing research facility. Today on the ISS, during this expedition, there are 329 research investigations in progress. These span topics from human research into how the body, human body performs in microgravity, basic biology and biotechnology, physical science, earth and space science, technology development, and education. There's never been this scope of research performed on a continuous basis in space. We are also in the midst of a one-year crew expedition. This mission will give us detailed information into the human adaptation into the space environment with mission durations approximately equal to the Mars transit time. We'll, we'll also get a unique chance through the twin study to see how the human genome changes when exposed to microgravity. We have kept a continual crew presence on the ISS for almost 15 years. 83 countries from around the world have used the ISS for research. Further, private companies through the National Laboratory and the Center for Advancement of Science and Space have used the ISS. This week in Boston, there was an ISS users conference. This is an exciting time as many new researchers are beginning to see the advantages of space-based research to augment their terrestrial investigations. The growth of non-NASA research is exciting and shows that there's a generic interest in using the unique properties of space to investigate basic research opportunities typically only done on the Earth. Space provides a unique window into any physical process that is affected by gravity. Further, the human body reacts in space with many conditions that mimic conditions facing the elderly, bone loss, muscle wasting, immune system degradation, and balance problems. Using animal models, unique insight, and potential new treatments for the elderly can be developed based on space station research. As the chairman stated earlier, operating under frontier space is not easy. In the past nine months, three independent cargo vehicles were lost on the way to the ISS. This graphically shows the difficulty of living and operating in space. The lost vehicles have different designs, different heritages, different manufacturing, different build processes, and utilize different ascent trajectories. The failure of these three systems shows the difficulty of launching and operating in space. We often think that ISS is only 250 miles away and that the journey is easy. This is not true. We are essentially operating these systems at the edge of our engineering capability. 
We also often think that if only we provide more insight and oversight, we can lower the risk of cargo delivery. Unfortunately, the demands required to escape Earth's gravity expose us to the same level of risk no matter how much insight uh, we add. But the, but the insight can, provide, can give us insight and help us understand the designs to make sure that we can end up with better designs. The right level of insight can reduce the design, can reduce and find design errors. However, much, too much insight can distract the teams from working on and improving design. It's amazing that even after these three failures, the basic ISS operations were not impacted. This is a tribute to the teams that manage and operate the ISS. They learned and are implementing the hard lessons from the Columbia tragedy that <clears throat> where the ISS had to operate without the shuttle for several years. The consumables management processes and logistics resupply techniques learned are proving their worth. However, these failures are not without consequences. Several of the agency performance goals associated with research and cargo flights will not be met. The ISS program is reducing consumables margins on ISS to favor research. This will not be enough to recover the research impacts. The delay in the Soyuz crew flight, which was required to allow the teams to understand the progress failure, required the ISS to operate for, with three crew for approximately three weeks longer than planned and will impact research crew hours. The impact of the loss also had real implications to students and researchers who lost cargo on the orbital ATK Cygnus flight, only to lose the replacement and return to flight hardware again on the SpaceX flight. They, sub they suffered a double loss. The loss of the international docking adapter can be accommodated schedule-wise without impacting the crew crew program, but will result in a dollar loss to ISS. ISS is a phenomenal resource for the nation. The research being done on ISS can be done no place else. ISS can serve as an innovation accelerator for private entrepreneurs, help NASA prepare for journeys beyond low Earth orbit, and benefits directly people on the Earth. Congressional support for ISS operations through at least 2024 would be a positive sign to the international partners and future users of ISS. Operating under frontier is not easy, and we need to not get complacent and think ISS operations are routine or easy. They are not. The ISS team has done a great job of managing in a technically demanding environment. The ISS team will continue to look for ways to improve. The ISS teams need to be given flexibility to manage, and others need to understand the benefits of dissimilar redundancy and how it can be used to provide robustness. The benefits of ISS will take longer to be realized than most can envision, but the benefits of ISS will exceed the expectations of all involved. I would also like to thank the committee for their support to human spaceflight, especially the authorization activity associated with commercial crew, SLS, Orion, and ISS. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Gerstenmeyer. I now recognize Mr. Elbon for five minutes to present his testimony. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Edwards, and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the Boeing Company, thank you for the opportunity testify today to provide an update on Boeing's role in the International Space Station. And Mr. Chairman, as one of your constituents, congratulations on your selection to lead this important committee. Boeing is extremely proud to have supported NASA in the design, integration, and assembly of the ISS. As NASA's prime contractor, Boeing delivered the U.S. elements of the ISS and provided system integration for the stage-by-stage -stage assembly on orbit of all U.S. and international elements. We continue in the ISS sustainment role today. On November 2nd, the world will celebrate 15 years of continuous presence in space, human presence in space, with international crews living and working aboard the ISS. At a time when many decry a gap in America's space program as we transition from the space shuttle to commercial transportation, we who know ISS know that America and our partner nations are making advances in space every day. The International Space Station has been recognized as the largest, most complex international scientific and engineering project in history and the world's largest endeavor in space to date. Ongoing improvements are making ISS even better. The station brought together hardware and software from 16 countries around the globe and 37 states and more than 10,000 suppliers in our country. About the size of an American football field, the ISS is larger than a six-bedroom house and has the internal pressurized volume of a 747. ISS is an engineering marvel, a beacon for international cooperation, 
and a shining example of what can be achieved through strong leadership and unity of purpose on behalf of humankind. As NASA's contractor for sustaining engineering of the ISS, Boeing is responsible for maintaining the station and ensuring the full availability of the unique research laboratory for NASA, international partners, other U.S. government agencies, and private companies. In performing this role, we continue to work with NASA to reduce the costs of sustaining the International Space Station. Over the past 10 years, we have reduced the cost of our sustainment role by more than 30 percent. These savings have enabled NASA to fund ISS improvements such as the NASA docking system, a critical component supporting the increase in the number of commercial vehicles visiting the station. These improvements help to keep ISS operating at peak efficiency today and provide a basis for continuing strong performance well into the future. With NASA, we recently completed a technical assessment of the usable life of major ISS hardware components. Our study indicates that the station will be operable at least through 2028. Long-term viability of the station is an important factor in continuing to attract researchers who invest considerable time in preparing their experiments for operation in space. The continuing on-orbit reliability of ISS and the improvements made to further enhance research, cap research capabilities are a boon to maximizing facility utilization. Our work on ISS enables many benefits and improvements, both to enable continuing human space exploration and to improve the quality of life here on Earth. ISS continues to be used for developing multiple technologies to, export ex to support deep space exploration. NASA is developing high, highly reliable life support systems to address needs for future exploration habitation systems. The ISS is also a testbed for learning how the body reacts to prolonged weightlessness and allows us to develop countermeasures now. And we are learning self-sustainment skills, such as growing food in space and recycling water. All these things are important to learn and understand before we explore farther into our solar system. Research in ISS has led to numerous improvements on Earth, from the medical field to Earth observations to providing clean water in underdeveloped countries to how we diagnose and treat patients in remote areas. Over the past several years, I've had opportunity to interact with leaders in countries that are not engaged in ISS or do not have a space program. Without exception, in every one of these conversations about space exploration, these leaders express a strong desire to be involved in space and more specifically the International Space Station. They see the value of ISS to inspire their youth, to pursue STEM education, to create economy expanding high technology industries and to provide a significant source of national pride. This fresh perspective from leaders outside Station International Partnership recognizing the tremendous value of ISS serves as a strong reminder to U.S. leaders and to all who are charged with the care of this national asset and global resource. We must never take what we have in ISS for granted. We must ensure that the International Space Station is well funded, meticulously maintained and operated, and fully utilized for meaningful, high value research. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Elbon. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Martin for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you for inviting us to be part of the discussion about NASA's challenges in operating and maximizing research on the International Space Station, a very timely topic in light of the loss of three cargo supply flights over the past eight months. The Office of Inspector General has issued four reports related to the topic of today's hearing during the past two years, including reviews that examine NASA's plans to extend station operations until 2024 and its contracts with private companies to fly cargo and eventually crew to station. We have five more reviews related to this topic underway, including an examination of October's cargo resupply failure, NASA's efforts to manage health and behavioral risk for extended space exploration, and challenges to international cooperation in space. Our audit last September of NASA's plans to extend the ISS reported that the agency had identified no major obstacles to continued operations through 2024. However, we found NASA must address a series of technical challenges, including ensuring adequate power generation in light of degradation of the station's solar arrays, as well as a limited ability to transport large replacement parts to station. While NASA officials estimate an annual ISS budget of between $3 and $4 billion through 2024, 
we anticipate the cost may be higher. First, much of the projected increase is attributable to higher transportation costs, and we found NASA's estimates for cargo and crew transportation optimistic. Second, most of the agency's international partners have yet to commit to station operations beyond 2020, and a, and a decision by one or more not to participate could drive up costs for NASA. As noted in our report, the number one operational risk for the ISS program is ensuring the ability to deliver supplies and astronauts to station. While NASA is working with two commercial cargo providers for redundancy, flights by orbital and SpaceX are now on hold, pending the outcome of accident investigations and approvals from the FAA and NASA. In addition to the loss of important supplies, the failed cargo flights have affected NASA research aboard station in at least three ways. Number one, by reducing available crew time due to a temporary delay in returning the station's crew complement to six astronauts. Number two, by increasing costs to replace the lost research. And number three, by delaying return of experiments due to the suspension of flights by SpaceX, the only comp company capable of bringing cargo back to Earth. Because NASA uses the ISS as a research platform to study a variety of risks associated with human travel and long-term habitation in space, it is an important part of its plans to send humans beyond low Earth orbit. As we have reported in the past, utilization of the ISS for research has increased over the years, but several factors continue to limit its full potential. For example, until a seventh astronaut is brought aboard the station, NASA will not be in a position to maximize crew time devoted to research. In addition, onboard crew will soon devote substantial time to reconfiguring the ISS to accommodate the commercial vehicles NASA hopes will transport astronauts beginning in 2017. To that point, late last year, NASA awarded $6.8 billion in contracts to Boeing and SpaceX to complete development of their space flight systems for crew. But NASA's commercial crew program faces several significant hurdles, including unstable funding, the need to provide timely requirements and certification guidance to contractors, and coordination issues with other federal agencies. Given its importance, the OIG recently initiated a follow-up audit to review the status of NASA's commercial crew program. And that concludes my prepared remarks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Martin. And I now recognize Ms. Oakley for five minutes to present her testimony. Good morning, Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Edwards, and Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss GAO's work on NASA's management of the International Space Station. As you know, the United States has spent tens of billions of dollars to develop, assemble, and operate the space station over the last two decades. The U.S. could spend billions more in coming years to further capitalize on the investment, given the potential extension of operations to 2024. Today I will discuss three areas. NASA's budget for ISS, second, some challenges that could affect increased use of ISS, and finally, steps that NASA and CASIS could take to better document and assess progress in this regard. NASA continues to make a significant investment in ISS each year. This investment is projected to increase over the next five years, mainly because the ISS program will begin to fund com commercial crew flights. In 2020, transportation costs will be over 55% of the projected $4 billion ISS budget. Unlike transportation costs, costs to operate and conduct research on ISS are projected to remain relatively stable through 2020. NASA officials have indicated that the funding priorities for ISS are crew safety and transportation, maintaining the facility, and finally research. As a result, any increases to transportation costs or operations costs could diminish available funding for research. Furthermore, the potential increases to the ISS budget as a result of the planned extension to 2024 are currently unknown. Second, NASA and CASIS face several challenges that could negatively affect their efforts to increase use of ISS for science, including cargo transportation failures and delays, 
limited progress in raising additional funding for research, and increased demand for crew time and facilities. Recent mishaps of the commercial cargo vehicles have had a direct impact on both CASIS and NASA efforts to increase research on ISS. For example, launch failures and delays have already resulted in the loss of CASIS-sponsored research and increased costs by almost $500,000. And let's not forget your crab cakes, Ms. Edwards. Furthermore, additional increases are likely as a result of the most recent failure. For CASIS, absorbing these increases has and could continue to be challenging because it has thus far made limited progress raising additional funds for science from external sources. For example, in 2014, CASIS had only received a little over $9,000 in contributions. However, as CASIS, CASIS has seen an increase in commitments from external donors. Specifically, in 2014, it received commitments of over $12 million. CASIS also faces challenges with competition for available crew time and a heavy demand for key facilities, which limits the amount and types of experiments that CASIS can bring to ISS. Crew time is already allocated at or over 100 percent. To address this challenge, NASA and CASIS are dependent on commercial crew providers delivering promised capabilities as planned in 2017. With these capabilities, NASA will be able to add a crew member to ISS who will devote most of his or her time to research, effectively doubling research time. However, many technical challenges and NASA's ability to fund the commercial crew program could delay these efforts. Finally, even if NASA and CASIS can effectively navigate these challenges, Demonstrating a return on investment is very difficult in scientific research and can oftentimes take many years. In the short term, it is essential that CASIS continues to make progress promoting research and achieving its goal of increased use of ISS. We reported in April that NASA and CASIS could do more to objectively define, assess, and report on such progress. For example, by assigning measurable targets or goals to its annual performance metrics. NASA and CASIS concurred and agreed to take action in response. In conclusion, potential extension of ISS to 2024 will likely require significant continued investments. As a result, ensuring that ISS capabilities are being used to support significant scientific gains is critical. Furthermore, demonstrating and communicating the return on investment could help support NASA and CASIS in achieving their shared goal of developing sustained commercial markets in low Earth orbit. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Edwards, and members of the subcommittee, this concludes my prepared remarks. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Oakley. Uh, now I'd like to uh, recognize Mr. Uh, Dr. Powelzik for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the subcommittee, good morning to you. I thank you for the opportunity to discuss the status of research using the International Space Station. It's the only platform of its kind, and it is absolutely essential to NASA's exploration goals. To prepare for this hearing, you asked four specific questions, and I'd like to briefly address each in the time allotted. You asked about opportunities and challenges. Well, the Augustine Commission emphasized three unique stressors that future astronauts will face prolonged exposure to solar and galactic radiation, prolonged periods of exposure to microgravity, and confinement in close, relatively austere quarters. All of these stressors are present in the ISS environment. Martian operations add more stressors, a dusty, dim environment and a gravitational field that's a little more than a third of our own. Unless we improve our centrifuge capabilities on the ISS, they're limited at the moment, we risk sending humans to Mars with little or no knowledge of how mammalian biology responds over years in a gravitational field less than Earth's. Two challenges dominate the landscape, limited crew time and limited access to the ISS. We can reasonably anticipate that competition for time will become worse as the facility ages and demands to perform necessary maintenance become more acute. Access is really a matter of competing programs. CASA-sponsored research and peer-reviewed NASA-sponsored research vie for scarce resources. 
better coordination between the two entities is needed. You asked about critical areas of research. The National Research Council's Life and Physical Sciences Decadal Survey, which was completed in 2011 at Congress's request, summarized and sequenced 65 high priority research tasks. Furthermore, the decadal study created two notional research plans, one with a goal of rebuilding a research enterprise and the other with a goal of a human mission to Mars. More about those goals in just a moment. You asked about priorities. Well, prioritizing ISS research isn't a new concept. In fact, we've been working on that problem for close to 15 years. But the key question for prioritization isn't scientific. It's programmatic. And it's something like this. Shall discovery research or fundamental research or translational research take precedence in the mature years of the ISS research program? The answer to that question has to be provided by government. Once those programmatic priorities are sequenced, can we prioritize the research? Absolutely. The LPS decadal survey provided a very detailed scheme and used eight unique criteria to do so. The process for operations, you were curious about that, it's well understood. CASIS receives its 50% allocation, followed by human research, then technology demonstrations, and what resources remain are de devoted to biology, physical sciences, and the science mission directorate. You asked about implications for extension and criteria that Congress should consider. Well, I think one of the first tests that Congress should apply can be answered with a simple yes or no question. Is NASA prepared to operate a robust research program through 2024? And in my opinion, the answer is an unqualified yes. Exclamation point, absolutely. The transformation of this organization in the past five years has been nothing short of remarkable in the life and physical sciences. I've provided seven examples of that in my written testimony. But there are large knowledge gaps for Mars missions that will be one year or longer. The IG recently reported on this topic, and there are four areas where I'd like to see the report go a little bit further. First, the IG found that extension to 2024 wouldn't provide enough time to mitigate 13 human health risks for a Mars mission. I'm not quite prepared to accept that conclusion. There's simply too many degrees of freedom to establish useful risk criteria at this point in time. These risks need the context provided by a thorough task analysis of future Martian operations. Second, the report didn't address powered down mass to any great extent, and we may need powered sample return for additional research tasks. Third, the IG emphasized average crew time as a metric to quantify research utility. It's a good metric, but I'm not sure it goes far enough. I think we need to work on the concept of efficiency and evaluate and improve the efficiency of the research time we have. And finally, the IG noted that research time is constrained with a six-person crew. We need that seventh member. So my top recommendations are the following. Prioritize the programmatic goals. Review the essential resources for extended mammalian research, including that seventh crew member, a scientist astronaut whose nominal responsibility is research. And finally, to extend biological experiments to cover a substantial portion of a mammalian life cycle and incorporate Martian gravity equivalents wherever possible. Given those sufficient resources, I am very optimistic that NASA can deliver another decade of rigorous translational research. I sincerely thank you for your support of the program and the opportunity to appear. Thank you, uh, Dr. Powelzik. Uh, I thank the witnesses, all the witnesses, for your testimony. Uh, members are reminded that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, this question will be for uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier and uh, Mr. Elbon. The SpaceX mission had a new commercial crew docking mechanism, water filtration device, and a new spacesuit on board. Uh, can you explain the impact of the loss of these items on the ISS and commercial crew programs, and how do you plan to mitigate these impacts? Mr. Gerstenmeier. 
Okay, we'll start with the international uh, docking adapter that's scheduled for commercial crew. Um, it was it was lost. We wanted to have two units on orbit before we began commercial crew flights. Uh, we'll still be able to, uh, we believe, to support that schedule. We'll take the parts from a third one unit that was being um, uh, assembled as a spare or a backup and, and, and uh, work with the contract to go ahead and extend that and get that delivered on time. The next docking adapter is scheduled to go in the next several months and we'll figure out the right cargo flight to take it up and one cargo or one docking adapter will be sufficient to support the commercial crew program. So I think we can accommodate that. The biggest impact to us is the, the cost associated with now having to manufacture a third unit from the spare parts that remain. On the multi-filtration beds, we think before the uh, Japanese transfer vehicle flies in August, we should be able to get a new transfer bed manufactured again through the outstanding work of the Boeing Corporation to help us uh, expedite that work, and we've got plans in place to do that. We've been trending down on the, the uh, toxic uh, organic compounds on board space station, so we're still in a stable configuration with the beds we have on orbit. We'll continue to monitor that carefully, but we should be okay from that standpoint. The loss of the spacesuit, we will probably now reconfigure one of the spacesuits we had planned on returning on space station. We'll do more repairs on it on orbit and we'll have that spacesuit available to go do EVAs. And, and again, we will, we've also uh, put a contract uh, change in place to work with the Orbital uh, Sciences Corporation to look at carrying uh, spacesuits in the future for us. So I think we've mitigated all three of the concerns that you have. Uh, the impacts will be not significant and we can accommodate them, but there are impacts with each one of the three. Thank you. Mr. Elbon? I'll just add to what Mr. Gerstmeyer said. Um, the most significant involvement from Boeing's perspective is with the docking adapter. The second unit is in Florida and will be ready to fly um, when we resume flying. And the third unit, the parts are um, available at our suppliers and in Houston and we're underway with putting the plan together to assemble that third unit to replace um, the one that was lost. Um, as Mr. Gerstmeyer mentioned, we're working very closely with NASA to understand the water filtration issue and to get those components ready um, to launch on the next um, resupply vehicles that go up. And um, so I agree that we're in good shape to support the crew on orbit. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, NASA's aerospace, and this will be for Mr. Gerstenmeyer, NASA's aerospace safety advisory panel has recommended that as NASA assesses ISS life extension, it should also review the objectives for continued ISS use and clearly articulate them to ensure that the costs and safety risks are balanced. Given that human space flight is inherently risky, uh, that risk always needs to be weighed against the value to be gained by the endeavor. What are NASA's objectives for extending ISS operations through 2024? Again, on the uh, human research front, there's uh, many medical investigations we're looking at that were described by other panel members about the radiation environment, the microgravity environment. And we need to understand those and have those risks mitigated and understood before we're ready to go commit to, to longer endeavors in space. And those are all in plans and are in place. We have uh, detailed investigations and in work. The current one-year expedition on board space station is addressing many of those, those issues and concerns, and that's moving forward. Okay, thank you. And then finally, uh, for Mr. Martin, uh, what insight does NASA have into the mishap uh, investigations being performed by Orbital ATK and SpaceX? Looking back at the Apollo 1 accident, the Challenger accident, and the uh, Columbia accident, do you believe that the investigations uh, benefited from an independent review separate from the contractors or, uh, or the program? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My understanding is the way under the FAA, since the FAA granted the license to the private contractors, both space, SpaceX and Orbital ATK, under the contract, they are leading the accident investigations. I believe with the orbital mishap that NASA has a separate review ongoing to try to get to the root cause there. But there isn't the same kind of independent accident, accident investigation board if it were a NASA-owned failure. And I think that's we're, we're currently conducting a review that's going to look at some of the concerns we have about the independence of a contractor-led accident investigation board. But again, pursuant to the contract and the license for the FAA, that's the way it's intended to be. Okay, thank you. And that uh, completes my questions. Uh, I now recognize the uh, ranking member, Ms. Edwards.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses again. Um, Mr. Martin's report of September uh, 2014 found that NASA's estimate for the ISS budget, three to four million do billion dollars per year through 2024, is overly optimistic. Um, that was reiterated, obviously, in your uh, testimony. And so I'm just really curious from Mr. Gerstenmeier if you could uh, talk to us about the basis of your estimates for projected crew and cargo transportation costs to support ISS. And I would note in that, for example, um, there have been three cargo mishaps in the last eight months. Was that factored into your projections for costs? Because it would seem that that alone would then begin to shoot uh, cost up if that would happen, if those kind of accidents, which one could expect might happen um, over the course of operations over another uh, to 2024. Um, so it would be helpful to know what your basis for those estimated costs are and, and um, respond to the challenges that Mr. Martin has laid out in his September 2014 report. We've been looking and working very uh, aggressively to look at cost uh, uh, management and cost control. We've uh, consolidated some contracts into a, a smaller number of contracts. We're also using competition to attempt to drive down the cost. We're in the process right now. We're in a blackout period of where we're going through a cargo resupply services number two contract award. We've got extremely good competition from that activity, and we believe competition will help us control and cold those costs down. So I think we're actively working. We're aware of those cost issues and the challenges in front of us. The teams have objective acquisition strategies. We have ex uh, uh, effective uh, consolidation plans, and we're removing costs from the program as we can, and we believe we can hold those costs down, and, and we can provide some objective evidence of what we've done and seen in past, past contracts versus future contract activities. And Mr. Martin, since um, I, I heard from Mr. Gerstenmeier, but since your 2014 report, is, would it still be your assessment that NASA's projections are overly optimistic? Um, and in your analysis, would you factor in three, um, you know, mishaps, failures in a year in terms of looking at the costs? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure whether they factored how many accidents in, but I do think that their cost projections are overly optimistic, continue to be. Over the life of the program, the ISS has shown an 8% increase annually in costs over the life of the program. And in fact, from 2011 to 2013, there was a 26% cost increase for the ISS. So moving forward, as we go out, as NASA considers extending the life of the station to 2024, it's projected that in 2024, 59% of station expenses will be for crew and cargo transportation. That's a big piece of the pie. Um, just curious for all of the uh, panelists, if you look at NASA's rationales for extending to 2024, they include research and technology discoveries uh, that benefit society, enabling human exploration to Mars, establishing uh, commercial crew and cargo to low Earth orbit, and sustain commercial use of space. Um, just curious as to whether any of you believe that NASA, what NASA's top priority should be. I mean, that's a that's a big list in itself, and it's kind of hard to figure out what should be uh, first versus uh, versus fourth. Dr. Powalczyk. Thank you very much for that question, and it's a, it's a great one, and I think it's extremely important one for for this subcommittee to take on. So the three biggies, as you mentioned them, really are this idea of discovery science. What are the big science questions that we want to have answered? We may not recognize the utility of those for a period of years. A piece of research equipment that we flew on my mission in 1998 was largely used in last year's Nobel Prize winning awards. So that's 16 years to recognize some return on that investment. But it's a very important return nonetheless. There's also translation, this idea of what do we need to do in order to go further. And of course, you mentioned the commercialization aspects. We have contended in the scientific community for many years that it is not our job to sequence those priorities. It is the job of government. It is the job of either the executive branch or the legislative branch. And I'll leave it up to you to sort out which is which. 
But I believe you've been pretty clear at this point. When I look at the authorization language for this year, you've said Mars is very important, but it's not an either or, it's an and. You will also, that NASA will also maintain a fundamental research program. So I think you've already told us that Mars is the answer. And when you look at the, the research that remains to be done, the risks that sit in the red, most of them, and about half of them, are associated with the extended duration on Mars of a notional mission of approximately three years duration. I don't know of another research platform that is going to provide us extended research capability to answer those three-year questions. The ISS is our choice for that, and I think that's how it should be used. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And now I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gerstenmeyer, in light of the recent launch failures, is NASA reassessing their insight and oversight approach for the development, production, and operations of commercially provided vehicles that service the International Space Station? As part of the uh, accident investigation with the uh, SpaceX uh, event that occurred, we have part of our uh, commercial crew program representatives are part of that activity with SpaceX. So they are actually actively involved in um, analyzing and understanding what occurred on the cargo vehicle with an eye towards any design changes, any process changes, any hardware changes that need to be made in the, in the crew program. So we're actively involved in, in transitioning that information from this failure directly into the crew program. Uh, thank you, and I, and I appreciate that response and effort on, behar on behalf of NASA. Uh, in my experience, NASA has a tremendous amount of insight and expertise, um, and I would encourage NASA to uh, show the leadership uh, that you indicate they are showing and the management skill that you indicate that they are doing uh, to assist with commercial crew so that they uh, can be more successful than they have been uh, most recently. Uh, this question is with respect to uh, Mr. Elbin and Mr. Gerstenmeier. Um, the loss of the SpaceX vehicle two weeks ago has been described as a big loss. Part of that loss was a replacement spacesuit for the International Space Station. Uh, what are the implications to the International Space Station program for the loss of this suit? As I described earlier, we will probably take one of the suits that's on orbit and then refurbish it on orbit instead of returning it to the ground. And then we will develop a capability to transport suits on all of our cargo vehicles so we can bring other suits up to space station as needed to support the EVA activity. Mr. Alban, do you have anything to add? The space suits themselves are not part of our sustaining contracts, so I'm not in the middle of working that. We do, however, help NASA with all the analysis necessary to figure out which activities need to be done on EVA so that we can make sure um, space station can um, continue to operate um, with the capabilities that exist there. What was the cost of that lost spacesuit? I, I don't have a specific cost, and I can take that for the record. It's, it's, we have 13 spacesuits available to us. They're from the shuttle program, and this was one of those suits. We will not replace that suit. It will just be continued to be lost, and it will not be replaced. We have sufficient suits remaining in our inventory to continue to operate safely through the 2024 and beyond time frame. Well, the items that NASA has had on these most recent launches, who is it that is absorbing the cost uh, of those uh, lost items that were being transported uh, to the International Space Station. Is that the commercial crew provider or is that NASA? For the NASA items, the, the losses are borne by NASA, and we estimate the NASA cargo loss roughly at about 110 or so million dollars on the SpaceX flight. Um, the researchers, they're responsible for their hardware. They bear the loss from the research hardware that was lost, and that's how it splits out. Is there going to be any future effort uh, by NASA in as much as we're hiring private contractors to require those private contractors to reimburse NASA for equipment materials lost uh, because the uh, private contractors were unsuccessful in launching uh, their vehicles? Our, our contracts today have a, a, a final milestone payment associated with successful delivery of cargo in orbit. Um, obviously, they will not receive payment for those for that accomplishment of that milestone. And we're investigating the advantages and disadvantages of having essentially insurance provided for these other capabilities or to provide for lost cargo in the future. 
We haven't made a decision yet on whether that is cost effective or, for us or not, but we're taking a look at that to see if it's effective to have insurance or it's better that we just essentially indemnify and, and the users bear the risk of uh, the loss. The monies that will be withheld as payment to uh, the private entity spacecraft uh, providers, is that enough to offset the losses that NASA has incurred? It offsets a portion, but not the entire amount. So American taxpayers can rest assured then that at least we'll have some uh, recoupment of the losses that American taxpayers have suffered as a consequence of the private sector provider's failure uh, to provide the represented craft. Yes. Uh, that's all, Mr. Chairman. I uh, yield the remainder of my time. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> and I uh, now, uh, now recognize the uh, ranking member uh, from Texas, Ms. Johnson. Is she here? Oh, okay. Mr. Barra from California. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank the ranking member for this hearing. You know, when, as a child growing up in Southern California in the aerospace industry you know, in the 60s and early 70s, you know, it was remarkable what we could accomplish as Americans when we dreamt big. And when we think about the International Space Station, it really truly is an engineering marvel, um, something that, you know, over time, has, um, you know, as the, the witnesses have noted, 15 years of uninterrupted humans um, living in space. Remarkable. When we think about this and when we think about um, where we want to go, we have to continue to think big as a nation. We have to not be afraid of thinking and addressing um, the issues, particularly as, you know, we dream about human space travel to Mars. We don't know how we're going to get there. But that should not daunt us, and that should not stop us, and that should not stop us from making um, the investments that allow us to continue to incrementally dream big. Again, that is what we've done throughout um, our existence as human beings. We've not been afraid to explore. We've not been afraid to ask those questions. And, and certainly this body has a responsibility to continue to push for the next generation of discovery. That said, as, you know, we increasingly move to this coordinated role between um, what the public invests in partnership with, with um, commercialization of space. Um, you know, the last few months have been a, a, a bit concerning. You know, we've been fortunate that the accidents um, did not have human beings on, on there and only cargo. But as we look at this partnership of commercialization um, and human space travel and, and taking um, human beings to the space station and beyond, you know, it is a bit worrisome. My question, um, maybe let me direct it to Mr. Martin. You touched on, um, you know, in, in light of these recent accidents and the, the investigation of these accidents, um, could you elaborate uh, and, and maybe uh, expand on NASA's role in making sure there's a, a transparent investigation? I mean, there is some concern if just the commercial entities are investigating without NASA's role, so. Sure, and I, Bill, I think, could go into a lot greater detail. Again, under the contract, since this is a commercial flight, space flight, the FAA gives the license. And under the contract, the contractor leads the accident investigation review. Unlike uh, a past Challenger accident or something like that, where NASA itself would convene an independent accident investigation board. My sense is that NASA is a member sort of an advisory member of Orbitals and soon to be SpaceX's Accident Review Board, but, but they aren't leading that activity. And perhaps Bill could go deeper on that. The, the NASA team is participating directly along with the FAA team and in NTSB on the SpaceX Accident Board. They developed a fault tree just as NASA has done, and the way they disposition each fault item is all three entities, NASA, FAA, and NTSB, and SpaceX, all have to agree that this item is closed and not contributing to this accident. So it's, it's by consensus. It's the engineering teams essentially led by SpaceX but fully represented by the government, and the government can say whether we accept or do not accept their explanation for what the root cause was. So it's a, it's a fairly effective way for us to have good insight in. We can do our own independent research on the side and contribute directly to the conclusions and make sure that we are representing the government. So we have the best from the FAA, the best from NASA, 
participating in those activities along with the contractor-led activity. And do, do you feel um, confident that there is that transparency in there and that we as a body, Congress, will will we'll be able to see that transparency and get the, the, the so, full details? So far, it's been extremely transparent. It was the same with the orbital investigation. We, we had that, uh, that same transparency with them, and it's, it's been effective both. And we can show ev direct evidence of where that transparency is and how it's, it's being uh, implemented. Okay, great. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you. Now I'd like, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gerstemeyer, uh, we know that planning for the ISS began 20 years uh, before it was actualized, and now we're less than 10 years out from the administration's proposed extension uh, to 2024. Uh, does NASA have plans for some sort of station in lower Earth orbit beyond 2024? Uh, perhaps some sort of public-private partnerships, perhaps with our current international partners for an ISS replacement? Uh, or does NASA intend to leave any uh, LAO station entirely to commercial companies? I think at this point we're, we're looking to see if we can leave low Earth orbit to commercial companies. Uh, what we're doing is we're allowing them to do investigations on station to see that they can get a market return and it makes sense to, to do that. Then that we believe the agency's role is then to push further out into space to go into the region around the moon we call the proving ground region of space. We will move our research and our endeavors into that further region. It helps the agency get prepared to take bigger missions ultimately towards Mars. So at this point, we're envisioning a low Earth orbit to essentially be more of a private sector activity, and we'll use the remaining lifetime of station to let the uh, private sector understand the benefits of microgravity research to their terrestrial investigations and see if it helps them from a fundamental research standpoint. Uh, that's great to hear. Um, our government is investing in capsules, Orion, Dragon, CST-100, Cygnus. Uh, most capsules are optimized to get crew and cargo back and forth to the ISS. Uh, what role will capsules play once the International Space Station reaches the end of its life? Again, for the commercial crew program and also the commercial cargo program, the uh, the companies have an interest beyond just the NASA need. They're building these capsules. They'll own the intellectual property. They'll be able to operate these capsules for their own purposes. If this private station we discussed earlier is available, they can use this transportation system to deliver cargo to it. They can deliver crew to it, et cetera, outside of the government. So this will essentially allow the private sector to go get transportation services on its own from these companies that we've enabled through these initial startup contracts on ISS. That's great. Uh, the Space Shuttle and X-37, uh, both examples of reusable spacecraft that lands on a runway, also have had track records of success. Has NASA completely ruled out the use of reusable runway-capable vehicles for crew or cargo in the future? Um, the simple answer is no. Uh, each, I think, uh, in case of the Orion vehicle, it's geared towards uh, deep space activities where carrying wings makes it very difficult to re-enter into the Earth's atmosphere. So the deep space vehicles will typically be a capsule-type vehicle, but for low Earth orbit transportation, wing vehicles are, are very nice and have many advantages as we, as we got to see through the shuttle program. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield back. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. And I'd like to now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Beyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gersten Meyer, um, on the one hand, we've had the three unfortunate losses that we've been previously mentioned. Uh, on the other hand, it seems that our commercial space industry is getting ready to grow exponentially, um, adding great value to our economy and our civilization. Uh, the new satellites, Internet, space tourism, even Mars are talked about. Can you help us put these accidents in the proper perspective, especially compared to train and airline and automobile accidents, 30,000 deaths last year, by the way, NASA tragedies, and all the transportation accidents in history. Are, are we looking at the, the relatively two or three that have come up in the right perspective compared to the last 150 years? That's an interesting question. I, again, I think uh, the positive thing is that in, in, both, in all three of these cases, there's been no loss of life. So that says our basic processes and procedures are in place. So we protected the public, we protected the launch site, we did the, the right things. 
I think the important thing is to not get so fixated on the problem, but, but how can we learn from this problem, right? As an emerging industry and a developing new transportation system, the more we fly, there will be small problems. They're acceptable in this case. As we described earlier, the impacts are not devastating the station. They hurt research, but they're still recoverable. The, the real tragedy will be if we don't learn from these events and we don't understand the engineering behind the failures and improve overall the industry. So I think just as the aviation industry has suffered a lot of failures throughout its history, the reason for its success today and the safety we get in the aircraft industry is a result of lessons learned and those lessons being applied to build better and safer aircraft. We need to do the same thing in the space industry. We need to take this learning from these events, internalize it, not be afraid of it, figure out how to make design changes, change the way we build spacecraft and build a more robust transportation system. So I see this as a, as a painful but maybe somewhat necessary learning process. It's excellent to learn on cargo. We do not want to learn on crew. We will learn from cargo and apply those lessons to crew. Well, thank you for your, your positive and your optimistic attitude, which I very much appreciate. Um, while, while you have the microphone, though, uh, the aerospace safety advisory panel, ASAP, has identified micrometeoroid and orbital debris as a top safety risk facing ISS. Uh, how does NASA address these concerns about uh, orbital debris? We have shielding on board our, our space station and spacecraft that can protect for some debris. We cannot protect for all debris. We've recently uh, implemented some changes to the Progress vehicle. The Progress launch that just occurred last weekend, it had uh, new debris shields on that Progress vehicle, so we're continuing to improve the debris protection capability. And then we, we actively train on orbit, just as we train terrestrially for fire drills, et cetera. We, we train for evacuation drills of space station in case we get hit by a piece of micrometeoroid debris that penetrates a pressure shell. So. We're prepared in that event. It is our highest risk when we look across the risk scenario. We've protected with the shielding levels that we can protect for at, at the stage of station's life. All right. Th thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Powelzik, um, you, you testified that yeah, you know, during the 2000s, as a result of NASA's priorities, that the, um, that the life, space life and physical sciences were particularly hard hit, and a lot of scientists actually left the field. Um, do you have any concerns about the level of the workforce and expertise in that field today, especially as we get ready to think about man's missions to Mars? Thank you very much for the question. I'd say the short answer is no. You're absolutely right that, the, that, uh, that, that those particular functions were very hard hit. We saw about an 80 percent decrement in the science portfolios and fundamental biology and in the physical sciences. One of the great things that has happened since 2011 is that NASA has reinstituted a ground-based program. If you look at the numbers of people who are applying, they're in the hundreds per, per solicitation right now. There's a, a active funding that is happening and bringing research up to the station. So you're starting to see that coming back. But what's even more interesting about it is that you're seeing um, maybe some of the youngest scientists that have really schooled in the entrepreneurial spirit saying, hey, this is something I'd like to take an opportunity and, and check out. You know, the, the ISS research uh, conference this week is about three times bigger than what it was just a year ago. So, so there's, there's a growing spirit, and we need to continue to feed that spirit, and I think great things will happen as a result. That's great. And thank you for your enthusiasm. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Yes, sir. <clears throat> thank you. Now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Bridenstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our panelists for coming and, and testifying before this committee. Mr. Gerstenmeier, I uh, appreciate your long and distinguished service at NASA, um, going back to uh, negotiating with the Russians on the Mir program and, and other things in the 90s. And that's really where I'd like to, to start um, today. When you think about right now, given uh, the recent accidents that we've, we've, we've gone through, um, we are seeing how important um, our reliance is on things like uh, the Russian Progress uh, cargo spacecraft and, the, of course, the Russian Soyuz crew uh, spacecraft. Um, given how the relationship has changed between the United States and Russia, uh, and we've even heard that, you know, the Russians have talked about pulling out of the International Space Station. What is your um, 
judgment on how this relation can go forward. How is it going on the civil space side, given the, the strained relations um, in other areas? Can you share with us your opinion on that? Yeah, the, on the civil space side, the relationship between the, the United States or between NASA and the, and the Russians is very strong. We exchange data every day back and forth. We pass many commands to the space station, Russian commands through U.S. assets. Uh, we use their assets, as you said, for transportation, reboost. We're very much mutually dependent upon each other for operations in space, and from a technical standpoint, the relationship is extremely strong, extremely transparent, um, in, in spite of the governmental tensions between the two governments. So there's a, there's a, um, the, the challenge of human spaceflight kind of transcends a little bit the, the toughness of the outside world, and we're working together extremely effectively with the Russians. The recent progress loss, they've been sharing data with us. We've been working together to actively get ready to go fly crew at the, the next, on the 23rd of this month with the Russians, and they've been open with us, sharing data with us helping us understand, they understand our needs, so the relationship is extremely strong between the, the civil space side. How confident are you that they will continue the partnership beyond 2020? Um, again, I think they're working through their governmental approval process. I think it's likely potentially by the end of this year when their federal space program gets approved that there will be an extension of the Russians' uh, support to space station through at least 2024. Okay. Mr. Elvin, uh, we have heard um, the IG uh, has a report indicating that uh, the operations uh, of the ISS are going to become more difficult uh, because of the ability to take replacement parts to the International Space Station. Recently, uh, Boeing had a report uh, that might not have contradicted but dealt with some of those issues. Can you share with us um, the Boeing position? They were suggesting that beyond 2020 things get really difficult. I think your report suggested 2028. Can you share with us how you're dealing with those issues? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, the study that we did looked at um, things like the structural integrity of the elements on board, um, the ability to survive micrometeorite um, kind of penetration, and came to the conclusion that through 2028 is, um, is completely feasible relative to the hardware that's on orbit. The other part of the question is what about the logistics resupply to um, replace boxes that um, fail on orbit? Um, computers, et cetera, and to um, supply the crew. And based on the um, logistics model that NASA has laid out and is using for the procurement of um, cargo resupply services too, you know, that kind of volume and up mass is um, sufficient to um, support the logistics resupply that's necessary based on our analysis. So we think through 2028 is, um, is completely doable. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier, um, I, I appreciated Mr. Posey's question about what, you know, what comes next uh, after the ISS. Clearly, whether it's 2020, 2028, we could lose partners. You know, we don't know when we might lose certain partners. We have to think about what comes next in LEO. Um, and I would like to just follow up with that. Um, it, can, can NASA provide a report to Congress on its plans for a roadmap? Um, or a timeline for certifying and testing, you know, post ISS, uh, a post ISS station in Leo. W whether, and I, I understand his question was about commercial and things like that, and certainly that's of interest as well. Uh, but it would have to be tested and certified, and NASA would have to be involved. Is that correct? And you can, can you provide a, a timeline to Congress for that? Again, I think the way we need to think about this is that the next private space station may not be, in fact, I don't believe it will be as massive or as big as this space station we have today with this International Space Station. It could be as small as uh, there's been discussion by the SpaceX Corporation of using their trans crew transportation modules called Dragon Lab where they can do in individual investigations. We've talked to Orbital about potentially using their cargo vehicle as a temporary um, space station in low Earth orbit. So I think when we think about the private sector taking over, we don't need to think about this big massive investment of a space station. They can learn what research really benefits them, if it's in the pharmaceutical area, if it's in materials processing, if it's in protein crystal growth, they can build a unique capability to do that. It can be much smaller. So I would think the private sector has the capability and can do that on their own. And again, I think NASA's role is to kind of move that human presence further 
and we want to go into the region around the moon so there may be a habitation capability again supplied potentially by the private sector for cargo in the vicinity of the moon but I think NASA's next focus is some kind of habitation capability potentially in the vicinity of the moon. Roger that I yield back. Thank you and now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Colorado uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks Mr. Chairman and, and thank you to the panelists uh, Mr. Administrators, good to see you. Some days you're here after we've had successes. Some days you're here after we've had some disappointments, but appreciate the fact that we just keep moving forward. And it's not easy. These are, you know, this is a risky business that you all are in, and we recognize that. We don't want to have many disappointments. We want to have mostly successes. Uh, and I was... Uh, um, I became more comfortable in understanding the kind of oversight that goes with the contractor-led uh, investigation process, that in fact you are uh, very involved and that there has to be some kind of sign-off as part of all of this because, you know, oftentimes we have everybody looking over everybody else's shoulder. This seems to be a pretty uh, sensible way to approach it, and, uh, and I appreciate that. Um, my questions are generally for you, Dr. Pawalczyk, and for you, Ms. Oakley, just really on, you know, what our research is doing on the space station that will help us as we move forward to sending our astronauts to Mars. And for you, so we have the, the researcher and the uh, futurist, if you will, sitting next to the one who has to figure out how do you pay for it and what's the return. So I'd like to have you answer just generally, how do you see the space station advancing our goal of going to Mars? And I'd like to ask you, Ms. Oakley, uh, what do you see in terms of the, the costs and the benefits from an accountant's point of view? So I'll just turn it over to you two. So to make sure that Ms. Oakley has time, I'll be brief. There are really three issues that we're, we're dealing with here. They are, they are the, the biological changes that we see in this continuous reduced gravity environment. Bone and muscle are some of the largest. It is this very energetic radiation environment that we understand to a large extent from the standpoint of solid tumors, but when we start to look at interactions of things like effects in the brain, accelerated cardiovascular Is, is this part of why you have one Kelly on the space station and one Kelly on the ground? It is. It's an absolutely unique experiment because genetically they're identical. And so the changes in space give you a chance to really talk about what's the variation that is exclusively because of the space environment. And then, of course, there are the behavioral issues. You know, we're moving in that futuristic role. Right now, the ISS really works in concert with the ground. When we begin to go to interplanetary operations, those crew members are going to be working quite autonomously from the ground. It's just a matter of distance. And so how people function independent of this planet will, will be very different than how we operate on the ISS today. Thank you. The bottom line is NASA does need a robust science program on the International Space Station to be able to achieve those longer-term exploration goals. Um, however, NASA has to be able to pay for it, and the Congress has to be able to pay for it. And um, that relies on a robust commercial participation in low Earth orbit to be able to do some of the things that NASA needs to divert funding for the longer term exploration goals to. So like Mr. Gersemeyer was referring to, being able to establish those markets in low Earth orbit to do some of the research that's going to be required to support those long duration human exploration flights is going to be essential. And getting them to pay for it is also going to be essential because going to Mars is expensive. So are you comfortable with the accounting and the auditing that's gone on to date on, the, on this program? I mean, the numbers? On the International Space Station program? Uh, I haven't looked specifically at the accounting associated with that. What I will say is, is that I haven't seen any cost estimates associated with extending the International Space Station program beyond 2020. Um, and I think that that's going to be key for the understanding of um, approving the funding and for everybody getting a, a very good understanding of what it's going to take to do the extension, to do the science that's required, and to do it safely. Okay. Thank you. Um, just uh, one more question and to, uh, to Mr. Martin 
you know, we've had some incidents now where there have been some failures. Uh, we had some schools in Colorado that had experiments uh, on both the orbital uh, launch and also most recently on the SpaceX. Same, same school. They did it twice and they lost both. Uh, how do we account for the cargo that's lost? How are, is there any compensation to those people or those schools or whatever? There is not. Uh, I think cases on the two flights of SpaceX and the orbital failures lost over $650,000 of cases funded experiments on those flights. The poor school children in your district who lost two sets, uh, NASA, as Mr. Gerstenmeier indicated, over $100 million, that's gone. The taxpayers have paid for that. Okay. Well, I thank you uh, for your testimony. Thank you all for being here today. And I yield back. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> and now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Knight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier, as a uh, police officer who does uh, investigations on accidents, uh, we have seen a big uh, change in our accident investigation over the last 50 years. Uh, I would expect we've seen a big change in, in investigations over uh, uh, space problems over the last 60 years. Uh, it hasn't been easy going to space in 1960s. It isn't easy today. Uh, can you give me an idea of how investigations go today and how we can uh, either move through the process, making sure that we're going through and hitting the points and making sure that we're uh, becoming safer as we move through the investigation, but also making sure we can go quicker uh, because the faster we can move, the faster we can uh, do more of this. It, kind of our underpinning is, uh, first of all, we need to be careful we don't uh, jump to conclusions or assume that we know what the failure is to begin with. So we do a very methodical process of where we gather all the data. We need to make sure the time synchronization of that data is all critical, and that's not easy. We're, you know, these events occur in milliseconds. So if you have a camera that's running at one and at a time is on that, you have to make sure that the time on that camera is identical to the telemetry that's coming from the spacecraft. You know, is the timing of when the event occurred recorded on the spacecraft or is it recorded after it's received on the ground? So that radio delay time to get down is important. So the first thing is to gather the data, get it all time synchronous. Then you can start through the methodical process of building what we call a fault tree. So we essentially brainstorm. There's now electronic tools available that automatically build a fault tree for us. They make you, they ask inquisitive questions. You lay out all the potential failures that it could occur, that could have contributed to the event, which ones have to occur maybe with another event. Then your team meticulously goes through and then crosses off each one of those events as they move forward. In terms of speed, what we're seeing here in the case of SpaceX is because they're a, a very much a vertically integrated company, they do almost all their work in-house, they immediately went to testing certain components. So even though they were they showed up on the fault tree, they said, why don't we just go ahead and build up a test rig right now and we'll be prepared to go test. So even these short number of days between the event and now, they're off, actually off in the laboratory actually doing some stress tests on some components that may contribute kind of as a parallel activity to this more methodical process I laid out. So I think the advantage and the, the speed piece is we can use tools, we can use analysis, we have software, and then we can do physical hardware tests in, in a much faster time than we did before. No, and, and I agree. I, I uh, talked to SpaceX several times since uh, since the incident, and uh, Virgin and Spaceship Company after Spaceship Two went down, and uh, and they were they were jumping on it quickly, and they were learning things very fast, and. Uh, and it seems to me that the investigation process and now with, with uh, um, private uh, companies being involved, it seems like it is going a little bit faster. And that is, a, that is a good thing. We want to make it safer. And I know everyone wants to make it as safe as they possibly can, and that's, that's the truth. Space flight uh, still is in its infancy, and, uh, and we're still learning, and we will be for hundreds of years yet. Um, and uh, the faster we can get through some of these investigations, the faster we can we can move and progress. Uh, doctor, I just had one question for you because I think that there was um, some good conversation there that we've got uh, an astronaut uh, working today and we've got one on the ground. And uh, I think that we'll get some good information there on what effects are on the body when we actually send people to Mars on such a long, prolonged space flight. Uh, can you give us an idea of what we're going to look at in the next 35 years or 
may be shorter, as, uh, as Administrator Bolden thinks, uh, of when we are going to go to Mars and the effects on the body, not just radiation, but, uh, but the time and space. So, Mr. Knight, I apologize. I forgot my crystal ball this morning, but, but I'll do the best I can. You're a kinesiologist. You should know this. <laughs> so, um, so we have mentioned, you know, a couple of those risks that we're seeing in the radiation realm. What's been really interesting to look at, if I had talked to you 10 years ago, I would have told you that I expected to see about 50 percent bone loss from a human being. We thought that that's essentially what gravity confers. We've seen with some of the uh, implementation strategies for countermeasures on the ISS that, that um, we're looking probably a lot better than that. I'm not willing to say that we have bone completely mitigated at this point, but some of the loading strategies are considerably better. We've also seen some newly emergent risks, and that's always the problem, one particular with uh, vision of astronauts, and that's been active, is actively being worked on by NASA. There's been a number of ground-based research protocols. So this is a great example of how NASA quickly identified a problem, immediately engaged the scientific community to try to affect solutions. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson. Well, thank you, folks, and uh, I'm a big fan of space exploration, big Buck Rogers fans, Star Trek, all of those kinds of things, growing up with them as a kid. I, I say that jokingly, but um, I can tell you that sitting, uh, sitting in my living room floor uh, between the summer of my ninth and tenth grade year and watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon it captivated me as it did the rest of the world. Uh, and I've not, I've never gotten over that. So I, I have tremendous respect for what you folks do and, and the discoveries that we're making uh, through our space exploration process. Uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier, uh, just uh, one question for you to start off with. Uh, the ISS has not yet been extended by Congress. However, the administration has proposed to extend to 2024. Um, how many of our international partners have agreed to extension, and what steps is NASA taking to build a coalition of our international partners for an extension? The uh, Canadian Space Agency has agreed to extend to 2024, so we have one partner on board that's the Canadian Space Agency who do a lot of our robotic activities and have the robotic equipment on board station. As I described earlier, the Russians, uh, potentially by the end of this year could be on board with the extension to 2024. The Japanese are also actively looking at station extension. They could do that again probably by the end of this year, possibly by the start of their next fiscal year, which is in April of 2016, and the Japanese are actively working that and we're working with them. And the European Space Agency, they're again working through their overall budget process. They're, uh, They've committed to support us on the Orion uh, capsule, as you know. The, the teams in Ohio are working with them on the European service module that sits underneath the Orion capsule. Um, they're pretty much committed. They're not committed to station yet. They will do probably that in 2017 formally, but they're doing all the activities of getting with all the member states and all the member countries to approve. And they see, again, tremendous benefit. It's just working through their, their big governmental process on the ESA side. So I think all partners are heading towards uh, station extension to 2024 in a varying time frame. A quick follow-up. How, how, um, how significant of a partner are the Russians. I mean, we're pretty dependent upon the Russians right now in terms of getting there and back, correct? Yes, we're, we're dependent upon them for uh, crew transportation. Uh, we also use them for uh, uh, attitude, uh, uh, excuse me, altitude adjustments of space station. They provide the propellant that reboots station. They're dependent upon us for uh, solar array or, or power generation. Um, they also use us for commands and other activities. So we're kind of mutually dependent back and forth. Between yeah. both are, are you having any discussions? I, I'm sure you've heard the testimony of the, uh, uh, of the uh, potential incoming new chairman of the Joint Chiefs who has uh, stated that the Russians are, uh, are our biggest security risk, security threat. Um, I mean, we're, we're kind of in a a dichotomy with the Russians here. Are you guys concerned about that? And what's your backup plan? 
Again, I would say that, uh, you know, first of all, that from a civil space standpoint, uh, as I described earlier, we have a very strong relationship with the Russians and we'll continue to do that. I think we need to, again, look at what happens if the Russians pull out in certain key areas. As we're working hard on the commercial crew program, we want to end our sole reliance on the, the crew transportation system as soon as we can, and funding for that is absolutely critical to get it in place so we can have a U.S. capability to augment the Russians in the December 2017 or so time frame. So I think we're moving out on crew transportation. The other areas that I described where we're dependent, we can we have workarounds and and we can we can uh, put systems in place to, to recoup that if we have to. But at the end, I think it's advantageous to us. If we can cooperate, there's real advantages to us. That's the right way to go forward. These endeavors require us all to work together, but we also need to be not so naive that if a problem occurs that we can't continue on without the, a, a certain partner. Okay. All right. Well, you know, I, I guess, you know, we've had some failures uh, with the uh, with commercial uh, uh, avenue uh, I, I, I certainly, uh, and, and I'm sure that you are, but, but I hope there's a lot of discussion going on um, because if, if we continue to experience uh, similar failures that like we had with the uh, commercial cargo program um, we, and, and the Russians were to back out, our, our options become smaller and fewer. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I remember when the space station was first approved, it only won by one vote in this committee. One vote. Boy, I'm glad I voted for it. That, uh, don't disappoint me. <laughs> don't disappoint me now. Uh, the... Um, Does anyone here know the uh, level of CO2 that is in the atmosphere of the space station? You have an internal atmosphere. What, what element do we put CO2? There's a lot of talk about CO2 in the planet now. What, what does CO2 do in the space station? I believe it's, it, we've been holding it low because of the uh, potential I problem, so I think we're running about uh, three um, millimeters of mercury of partial pressure of uh, CO2 on board station. How does that compare to uh, the CO2 that we have in our atmosphere here? It's slightly higher than the atmosphere we have in the room here. And we've typically allowed, prior to the inter intercranial pressure problems associated with the vision, we allowed it to, to go up on the order of six or so uh, millimeters per mercury. So, and that's dramatically higher than the environment here. So it's slightly higher CO2 levels on board station than we see here. Okay. Have there been any health-related problems to uh, this increased level of CO2 that it, astronauts breathe in uh, during their time at the space station as compared to what they would breathe in here? Yeah, again, the, the we're not sure, but we think it could contribute to the intracranial pressure problem, which causes the eye and vision problem we described. At higher elevated levels of CO2, you can get headaches, you can have some other physiological problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we try to control that as low as we can. We have a, a Russian device that removes carbon dioxide. We have a U.S. device that removes carbon dioxide. And then we also have some uh, absorbent material that also removes it. And then we have a next generation of system that will fly on the Orion capsule that's also on board station, and we can use that also to remove CO2. Because we are actually exhaling CO2 all the time, right? So we have to be, if you're in an enclosed environment, be very concerned with uh, what the human body itself is exhaling. Um, in terms of the um, uh, future of space station, uh, do we have plans to expand uh, put different uh, elements onto the space station at this point? Currently on the U.S. side, we, we just reconfigured the, uh, the permanent uh, multi-purpose module from one location to another location. That was to make room for a docking adapter that we discussed earlier to let commercial vehicles come. 
That's about all we're going to do on the U.S. side. There's no major new additions coming. The Russians have talked about a solar power platform to provide some uh, solar energy for their segment. The Russians have also talked about a multi-purpose logistics module, another research module that they may add to station. So Is the Russians the, um, may the, add some additional modules, but we on the U.S. side don't have any major additions planned. Yeah. Uh, the Bigelow Company has uh, has actually invested a considerable amount of money in developing a new concept for space habitat, uh, the inflatables. Is there any uh, uh, is there any uh, use of this technology? Yeah, it'll be added to space station next year as a demonstration capability. This is an expandable module that will be added to the outside of station. It will stay there for about a year or year and a half, and then we'll remove it from station. Its purpose is to investigate the uh, advantages of an expandable module. So instead of a rigid pressure shell, it's to understand what we can gain from uh, the expandable technology. It has a very thick wall, so it may be better from a micrometeoroid debris penetration standpoint. It also may be better thermally uh, that needs to be looked at, and the acoustic environment may be better. So the idea is to get it on orbit, actually take those claims, test them on orbit with space station, use unique capabilities of station, confirm if that module technology is something we want to use going forward. And it might as well, and it might also be cheaper than the traditional way of building a space station, uh, which is something we should be concerned about. I, let me just note two things. One is that orbital debris is the, continues to be and always was and, and is an expanding concern. Uh, I believe that this is something NASA should look at, not just in terms of space station, but we should be uh, thinking about uh, international cooperative effort to just uh, deal with the with the debris problem. That's some, something we need to. This committee should be dealing with uh, at least uh, in the in the time ahead. And second and last of all, let me just uh, note that your report on your cooperation with Russia uh, during this time period, when there are uh, how do you say frictions going on between the United States and Russia, uh, I think is uh, demonstrates a very wonderful aspect of, of space, and that is that uh, once you get up there, uh, you look back down on the earth and some of those problems don't seem as important, or, or you put it in perspective, we're, we're able to put it in perspective, and I'm happy to hear that we are and that the Russians are putting these areas of friction in, in perspective to the point that we can work together and create a better world while we're doing it. So thank you very much for demonstrating that to all of us. Thank you. Uh, we have just had votes called, and, uh, and I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for all their questions. Uh, I really, if we'd have had time, I would like to have gone through with a second round, but the record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and for written questions from members. And it's our hope that the Office of Management and Budget will work more expeditiously with NASA uh, to put together responses to these questions. The committee is still waiting for NASA's responses to questions for the commercial crew hearing from uh, six months ago. Uh, Mr. Gersenmeyer, uh, please send back the message that these delays are not acceptable. <laughs> uh, the witnesses are excused, and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. No.